Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman, the one and only from Kailua, as obtrusive and obnoxious as I can be on any <laughs> given day. I'll, I'll, I will probably maximize that today. I've already started off with a, a good email trail that I'm probably going to pay for later. Anyway, today's show is really important. I can't overemphasize the importance and really pertinent to what's going on today. And I want to start off by saying there's a thing that I have from my flying background called a PIO, pilot-induced oscillation. And it's what happens when you're flying along, especially when you're getting close to landing and you're, you're kind of on the edge of the envelope where your airplane's not all that stable. And you put in a flight control thing, it doesn't, doesn't do what you want it to do, so you put in a little bit more, and then all of a sudden it takes hold, and then you overcorrect, and then you undercorrect, and you overcorrect, and pretty soon your airplane is doing this. Well, inflation is kind of that going on in your economy. So I've got my friend Dan Gowan here who happens to know quite a bit about economics and oil prices and bonds and markets and the software that controls what they do together. Um, and he's gonna try and make this something that we all understand. And it's really tied to energy because energy is tied to so much of what goes into your economy, the manufacturing, the resourcing of raw materials, the transportation of raw materials, the transportation of finished products, and even just going to the market to pick up your finished materials. They all require fuel and they all require energy to manufacture or to move. So energy plays a huge role in, potentially huge role in inflation. So Dan, take it away. Thank you, Stan. Uh, if I can get slide number one, please. Uh, the reason why Stan had me give this talk is one of my uh, security clearances. I'm Treasury certified, so I'm one of the few people that kind of qualified to even talk about this subject. Uh, I've got some intimate knowledge into the Treasury's computer system, the Federal Reserve, so I have a good idea how a lot of it works. And I'm going to try to keep this as simple as I can and try to try to explain to people how it works. So, can I get slide number two, please? Okay, what this is from, this is from Star Trek. It says season three, episode 17. So it's the original series, it's that which survives. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the complete story. If you want to go watch that version of Star Trek, I, it's a good story. Go watch it. Easy enough to find somebody where you can get on, online on the internet. Um, anyway, what the basic story is, an alien has sabotaged a ship and has burned the fuel regulator to the engine wide open. So the, the engine is uncontrollable and the speeds are getting faster, faster, faster. Now with Spock and uh, the, the actor you see right there, that is actually James Doohan, which plays Lieutenant Commander uh, Montgomery Scott. And what Spock has proposed is that Scotty insert a, uh, a magnetic probe into the flow of fuel going into the engine. Now, most of the public doesn't under, won't ever really comprehend this, but for an engineer or scientist, this image right here is absolutely terrifying. And here's the reason why. Imagine a four megaton hydrogen bomb, multiply that by a thousand. That's what's going into this engine every second. And this guy is going to stick his hand in. Okay. So that's why this is terrifying. Now, their choices are simply this. One, if they do nothing, some wide around warp 15, the ship explodes, goes up like a supernova. Now, he could uh, risk cutting off that fuel supply, but just by doing that, he could risk blowing the ship up too. So either way, it's a gamble. And I go to uh, slide number three, please. Okay. What there you've got, uh, notice the title says Federal Reserve now. Now, what you've got there on top, that note you have there on top, that is a United States bank note. Note it has the uh, red treasury mark. That's an actual certified uh, 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 currency as defined according to the Constitution of the United States. What I'm going to tell you has to do with the legal distinction. Now, um, when it comes to trading securities on electronic formats, those securities could those securities either have to be bonds or stocks. They have to be certified securities. In other words, legally, because of the Constitution and how it how it strictly defines currency, what money is in the United States, um, that we're not actually able to trade that that top note on any electronic exchange. So you have to use that bottom thing down. Now, on the top there it says a Federal Reserve note. 
technically what a Federal Reserve note is, it's actually a bond. It's a bond. It's a, what they call a zero coupon bond. It's a bond that doesn't um, that to, uh, that pays no interest is what it does. OK, but the point is, I can trade that bond for other bonds. And it's important to understand that concept. Legally, that's the only thing that can be traded on electronic exchanges are those bonds and stocks that you cannot trade currency. And it has to do with because the Constitution is pretty strict on this subject, what they consider money. OK, uh, can I go to slide number four, please? OK. What's on that picture right there? That happened February 14, 1945. Uh, the gentleman in the center there, that is King Abdul Aziz Saad of Saudi Arabia. Uh, to the right there, that is President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They're on board the USS Quincy on the Red Sea. That right there was the, the birth of the petrodollar. What happened was these two major powers who um, are both those countries that, well, even today, they export large quantities of oil into the international market. What they decided to do is price all oil in dollars, okay, which, which really means that the, that oil is going to be priced in essentially U.S. government bonds, okay? Um, now, this, if this uh, um, as far as uh, uh, oil being priced in dollars, that has been true since 1945, all the way up until the year 2018. Some, and I, I just keep this in back of your mind, something happened in 2018 that was rather important. And that was the first time oil was priced in non-dollars happened in, uh, was March 26, 2018, Shanghai, China, it was priced in yuan, and that was between Iran and China. And today we have four countries that price oil in non-dollars, and that happens to be Iran, Venezuela, Russia, and Oman. Oman joined this group last week, right? Not only that, but uh, if you go to Russia, try to buy natural gas or oil from the Russians, they'll make you convert that into either rubles, euros, or Chinese won. They will not accept dollars for their hydrocarbons. That's important to remember that. Uh, can I go to slide number five, please? Okay. U.S. oil production. Uh, because um, oil is the primary uh, commodity for the entire planet, everybody has to have oil for gasoline and diesel, especially since we use gasoline and diesel to transport any commodity around, around the planet. Truck, train, pipe, or ship, okay? Even the pipes require the burning natural gas to power the pumps, okay? Truck, train, pipe, or ship. Because of that, all commodities in the world are priced in dollars. Corn, wheat, pork bellies, turkey, chicken, you name it. It's all priced in dollars. Okay, so the whole world has to have dollars. That's what makes the, the dollar the world's global reserve currency, because if you're going to buy, uh, buy and sell those commodities in the international markets, you're dealing with dollars. Okay, you're going to have to convert your currency to dollars to buy and sell in those commodities for the entire world. Uh, what that... Uh, Chart there shows you basically it's just a more proof what I was telling you about the U.S. oil production that right now we're only producing between uh, between uh, what we got here between 11 and 12 million barrels a day. Well, we're, we're starting to drift back up, but for for a good chunk of this year we were sort of underperforming. But that's all that really really shows. Can I get uh, slide number six? Here? Okay, and that there you says uh, USA gasoline and storage. Okay, so there's a little little bit of information about this slide, but I'm going to use this slide to explain about the dynamics between supply and demand. Okay, well, first of all, we've had an uptick in the amount of gasoline and storage here in America. The reason why that happened is because Joe Biden, President Biden, took some oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and sold it to some of the big oil companies, and they refined it and turned it into gasoline. Because they've increased the amount of supply of gasoline that caused the prices to drop. So remember that concept. And that is, if you have a lot of something that drops the price, if you have a small amount of something, the prices increase, supply and demand. Okay, those two things are linked together. Now, probably the best places I can give an example of how that dynamic works out in an economic system, it has to do with inflation versus deflation. When you have an economic system, you always want to have it so where you have a uh, where you have more demand than you have supply. That gives you a positive spin in your economic system, and you can that'll give you inflation. 
and you use the interest rates on debt because money is actually loaned into existence, okay? And so by raising or lowering the interest rates on that debt, you can control the rate of inflation. So by limiting the supply of your commodities, you got more demand than supply and those interest rates, you can use that to keep your economy in balance. Now, examples of when it gets out of balance, one of them had to, be, had, had to do with the Great Depression, the reason why the depression had occurred. During the 1920s, a lot of manufacturers uh, entity business entities went out there and they borrowed a, borrowed a lot of money and they used that money to build a lot of manufacturing capacity. So when the 29 stock market crash happened, all this demand crash, crashed because people lost their jobs, they couldn't consume as much, so forth. But you had all this manufacturing capacity tied to all these debts. And because you had all this, and so that depressed the prices on what they were producing. And they could just make barely make payments on this debt they were they were dragging around. Not only that, but they drug this debt around for about 10 years. What broke the cycle finally was at the beginning of World War II, President Roosevelt, when he had the War Powers Act, he went out there and shut down a bunch of these factories and liquidated all that bad debt. And so when he, when he did that, that brought the economy back into a balance between supply and demand. And then he was able to use that to rev the manufacturing engine back up and get us through World War II. And that led to the economic recovery right through the 50s. And the 50s were actually a pretty good economic time for the United States. But it goes back to understanding that relationship between supply and demand. And that was just, uh, you know, that's just a, some basic understandings in economics and how that works. Uh, now, as far as inflation, let me give you some examples. If you don't have inflation in control, how it can whip your economic system apart. So, for example, right now in the Middle East, they're completely sold out of urea. Urea is fertilizer, if you didn't know that. And what's happened is because the, the natural gas prices this summer has been steadily going up. And if you listen to some of our previous talks, you know that a major component for making ammonia is natural gas. And they take ammonia and they can turn that into urea, which is basically take some carbon monoxide, some molecules of ammonia attached together, and that's how you make urea. But what's happened is, is people out there are seeing the prices, the natural gas steadily going up. So what they did is they went and bought up all the urea they could, all the fertilizer they could, before the prices went higher. That's called hoarding. And you'll find that whenever people are noticing that, well, for example, let's say you had a jar of baby food. Let's say this week I buy it for a dollar. Maybe three weeks from now, I buy another bar jar of baby food. Then it's $2. Three more weeks after that, I buy another jar of baby food. It's $3. What happens is most people get in their mind, well, the prices are going up. I have no idea how high the price is going to be three weeks, one month, two months out. So what do they do? They start hoarding, hoarding as much as they can, right? Uh, what happens at the manufacturer, when the manufacturer sees that all my baby food was sold at this place, what they do, the, the, well, understand, they only have a certain amount of manufacturing capacity. When they build manufacturing capacity, they have to go borrow the money to build the factory, okay? So there's a limit there. What they do is they start raising the prices. And because they start raising the prices, the people, your consumers, they start hoarding more of that stuff. And then the manufacturer, he raises the prices even higher. So you get this feedback loop. It starts flipping, and then and it's between that manufacturer and the consumer, between the supply and the demand. And that's how the inflation starts feeding on itself. As an example, right now, uh, lithium carbonate, the prices are sky high. And if you order any lithium carbonate for making some of your lithium ion batteries, right, you'll have to wait eight months before they'll deliver it. Before or you can lower the lithium carbonate and they deliver between 30 and 90 days. Now you got to wait eight months. And it's because they still haven't mined this stuff out of the ground. And what they've done is they've raised the prices because people are paying those prices because they're hoarding the lithium is what's going on. Vegetable oil, the price of vegetable oil has already doubled in the last year. At, this is at the wholesale level. The price of potatoes have already doubled, again, at the wholesale level. The price of soybeans have already doubled, again, at the, at the wholesale level. The price of lumber. Lumber crashed last July. Guess what? They recovered all the costs and not only that, but the price of lumber has doubled since last year at the wholesale level. So we have inflation in our economic system, and it's and it's it's feeding on itself. There's a feedback loop there. Any questions so far, Stan? Now, just the the connection again back to energy. You know, the lithium batteries connected to energy. Yeah. The uh, the moving of food and the and the tying of so many commodities to transportation goes back to energy. You can't afford to get this kind of instability in the energy sector because it has a multiple multiplying factor 
through the rest of the commodities that are traded. Well, also recognize, we already pointed out, there's a link between oil and the dollar yep. directly. There's a direct connection. That is the master resource. And since it is sold throughout the world in dollars, therefore you have to have dollars. So you got money connected to the master resource, which is energy, right? You get high energy prices. It'll feed back into your, in your financial system, right? And if you don't get this thing under control, it can tear your economic system apart. We'll talk about that. So there's a direct connection between the money and oil and energy directly. Okay? And it's wired directly into the, the foundation of the system. Uh, can we go to slide number seven, please? Okay. This has to do with yield curve, uh, uh, what's called a positive yield curve, what that is. Okay. So what you've got there on the screen, uh, that has to do with the United States Treasuries. And what the idea behind a positive yield curve is simply this, and that is your short duration bonds have a low interest rate on them and longer duration bonds have a higher, inter yeah. a higher interest, on, interest rate on them. And it has to do with risk. If you're going to buy one of these U.S. government bonds, and you're going to hold on for, for 30 years, right? You're going to be want to be paid a higher interest rate for your risk. Now, understand a U.S. government bond is essentially risk-free debt because it's being issued by a government, the U.S. government. So that, that right there, what I'm actually showing you, that is the real reserve currency. The world is using these bonds to trade for those commodities, okay? They don't necessarily care about what the yield is on them, just as long as it's a positive yield, but they're actually trading these things for those commodities, for your pork bellies, for your oil, for everything, okay? Now, the thing about bonds is uh, the price uh, is that the... The price of your bond is inverse to the interest rate on it. What that means is if the price if the price of your bond is high, the interest rates are low. But if the price in your bond is low, then the interest rates are high. These bonds are sold at auctions. So basically the government wants to uh, the, the, the government wants to get the most money as it can, so they want the prices to go out and they're trying to convince you to pay them more money for their bonds. Now if there's a lot of demand for the bonds, the prices will be high and the government only has to pay a little interest rate on, them, okay? So that's high demand, pay a little interest rate. But if nobody wants those bonds, what the government has to do to entice you to buy the bond is raise the interest rates on those bonds, okay? So remember, the price of the bond is inverse to, to the interest on that bond. They go back and forth, right? Now, the Federal Reserve controls the bond market. And here's how they do it. They do it in three different ways. And contrary to popular belief, these three different ways are really nothing new to the Federal Reserve. The truth is all three of these uh, things that they have have been in the Federal Reserve Act since 1913. The first one is, is they, well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is actually a private institution. The employees are government employees, but the Federal Reserve is actually a private institution. The people that own them are actually the member banks, JP Morgan, Citibank, they actually they own their they own their Federal Reserve. So it's a, a public employees, but private institutions. What that means, you can subpoena the employees and get them to talk to Congress. But if you try to audit the Fed, you're going to go through a court because technically that is a private corporation. Now, how they control it is the the Federal Reserve controls the interest rates, how the banks, when the banks loan each other money, the Federal Reserve controls those interest rates. That's called the interbank banking rate. And that's really down on the short end of the curve. Now, on the upper end of the curve, how they control it is with QE and QT, quantitative easing, quantitative tightening. What quantitative easing is, is where the Federal Reserve goes into the bond market and they start buying up all the bonds. When they buy up all the bonds, what happens when they buy up all the bonds? The prices, the bonds go up and the interest rates go down. That's how the Federal Reserve is able to force the interest rates go down, by buying up all the bonds out of the market. Now, when it comes to quantitative tightening, that's where the Federal Reserve takes the bonds on their balance sheet and they sell them into the market. In other words, they flood the market with bonds, okay? When they flood the market with bonds, it causes the prices on those bonds to fall, but the interest rates to go up, okay? So it's important to understand that concept. So QE is they're buying up all the bonds and forces the interest rates down. QT is where they sell them into the market, right? And that causes the interest rates to go up, okay? Yeah, so fine. now when, when you have the Federal Reserve making those purchase, bond purchases or sales, is that really 
um, the big banks making those purchases and sales? Well, basically, uh, when you go to the bond auction, the primary dealers are those big banks. Yeah. They're the ones at the bond auction. You and I are you and I buy those bonds from the banks, but the banks are at the auction. They're buying them directly from the treasury, right? Okay. And the banks, so when they buy them out the treasury, they can turn around and sell them directly to the Federal Reserve. It, it, basically, the Federal Reserve says, hey, I want these bonds. The bank buys it, gives it the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve gives the bank something called, uh, they're called bank reserves is what they're called. So technically, the Federal Reserve is not actually printing money. What they're actually, money is actually loaned into existence. The so Federal Reserve is a bank that has the ability to lend unlimited amounts of money. They don't print money, they lend money into existence. It's sort of like when you create a mortgage, you put down your 10%, your banker creates a mortgage-backed security and he loans money into existence. That money doesn't exist, it's actually created by that loan. And then that loan turns into a mortgage-backed security, which it gets sold out in the market. So money is lend, loaned into existence, okay? Um, if I can get you to page number eight, please. Or, yeah, okay. Yield curve inversion is equals recession. What happens with a yield curve inversion, that's when the Federal Reserve decides they're going to tighten monetary conditions. They can do that in two ways. One is, is they can uh, raise the uh, interest rates on those bank, uh, bank loans, and that causes the, the yields on the short-term bonds to be higher than the long, longer ones, okay? Um, the other way they can do it is stop buying bonds using QE, that might do it. The other way you can do it, they can start selling bonds into the market and that could do it. Now, give you an example of what yield curve conversion looks like. Let's say I had two-year bonds that paid 5%, but yet the 20-year bond is only paying 1.5%. That means the shorter term bonds have a higher interest rate than the shorter term ones. And if you look at that chart right there, if I can get you shown number eight again, see that pink area there? Whenever the that's when those yield curve, curve conversions happen. Notice 1929, we had a yield curve conversion. All right, that causes a crash. Here's how that works. When you're talking about U.S. government bonds, remember this is the same people that make the money. So this is risk-free debt. Uh, now, whenever the government does QE, basically they buy up all the government bonds. Remember, they bought up all the risk-free debt. That's okay, and they've dropped the interest rate. And what that does that forces everybody. Is you, I can't afford to own a bond that pays me no interest because there's always still a little bit of inflation or whatever. So it forces everybody to go out and buy up all the stocks, all the corporate bonds is what happens, okay? Now, whenever the government does this QE inversion thing, what happens is everybody sells off all their stocks and their bonds to rush toward that two-year bond that's paying 5%, okay? So that's how you get a stock market sell-off in the process. Uh, but also remember all the other things that are tied to those bonds. Like, well, for example, let's see, oil, okay? So if you have this yield curve conversion, right, that, that, that has a lot of other um, knock-on effects to it. One of them has to do with commodities. Uh, whenever you get these yield curve conversions, one of the things that happens, I, I just described how the stock market sells off, it, what happens overseas in other countries Depending on what interest rates look right, look around other government bonds, what will happen is it'll trigger, trigger a sell-off in other stock markets and bond markets around the world. People will trade their currencies for the dollar. That means their currency drops in value, the dollar goes up in value, just so they can buy those bonds, okay? Well, <clears throat> whenever that happens, that means it takes fewer dollars to buy a barrel of oil. That means oil could go from $80 a barrel, drop down to 10 bucks. Right? Hey, good for the consumer, inexpensive oil, right? Yeah, bad for the producer because when prices drop like that, the guy that's running the oil well or the refinery, he stops making oil, he turns the tap off, or the guy running the refinery, he turns the refinery off because he's losing money selling you fuel at that price. And that all happened because you got a crash in the commodities market. And that's because the dollar went too fast up in value right? Fewer dollars to buy the same oil, but yet it doesn't change the cost of producing end products. It's a little bit complex, but if you think about what I just said, it'll make a lot of sense. Okay, if I can get to page number nine, please. Okay, so we go back to that thing here. It says the needle jumped and the magnetic ball. Okay, so in this case here, um, the guy there is envisioned, that is Jerome Powell, and he's trying to cut off QE, 
And what happened when he started inserting that magnetic probe into the engine, the, the needle in the magnetic bottle jumped. Now, the Federal Reserve, um, since 2019, they've been pumping $120 billion a month into the markets of QE. That's $80 billion worth of bonds and $40 billion worth of mortgages. The Federal Reserve, BlackRock, has been going around the United States buying up all the single-family houses, um, and BlackRock's turning those into mortgage-backed securities, and the Federal Reserve's been buying those. So right now we have a housing bubble that's bigger than the 2008 bubble. 95% uh, of Americans cannot afford to buy a house, and the culprit is actually the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is trying to keep the housing market from, from collapsing, OK, but uh, they've created a bigger problem in the process. The other problem is, is our stock market. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. There's something called the, uh, the Buffett indicator. That's Warren Buffett. Right. You go through and look it up on Google. Well, the Buffett indicator is a valuation indicator. Right. And it's a really good indicator to tell you when you're going to have a stock market crash. But right now, the Buffett indicator the reading on the Buffett indicator is 211%, okay? What that means is, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing warp 15 in our, in our starship. The sub right around 16 or 17, she's going to blow up, okay? okay. So I'm just... I'm going I'm, I'm to give you your two-minute warning now. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, go to number 10. Okay, January, uh, January 3rd, the... Uh, that was January 3rd. There was a spike in the 10 year. Remember, Jerome Powell did that QE, started cutting back and buying those bonds. We got a jump in the uh, the 10 year bond, 1.7%. Uh, to give you an idea what happened last week, the 30 year bond lost 9.35% of its value. The 10 year bond lost 4.24% of its value. Now, you didn't see that big of a jump in the stock market. And here's the reason why uh, there's a type of bond called TIPS. It's um, it's an inflation protected bond is what it is. Well, what's happened is, is the Federal Reserve has bought up 25% of the TIPS market to keep the, uh, the rate on those bonds from going up. And the reason why is to, so the federal government doesn't have to pay as much on those bonds because they already know the rate of inflation's high. The other reason why the Federal Reserve did that is because all the ETFs on the stock market are tied to the TIPS index, and that keeps the stock market from blowing up. So if you want to know why the route in the bond market that happened last week did, blow up the stock, did not blow up the stock market, it's because the Federal Reserve owns most of the TIPS bond market because they know all those ETF funds, that's computer-traded funds, exchange-traded funds, are tied directly back to that TIPS bond. And oh, by the way, the 10-year bond is tied to, to mortgages, right? Just so you understand that. Uh, the last page, page number 11, please. Okay, what that is, that's called the golden zone. You see that line right there? That's a relationship between the 10-year bond and the CPI. Um, the, uh, the December reading on the November rate of inflation was 6.8. What that relationship there shows you, uh, all the dots you see there, that's where the Federal Reserve has set policy uh, uh, in the past, and that's where the 10-year rate ended up. And if you notice that red area, that's where Jerome's been setting the interest rates before. Now, with a CPI of 6.8, what that means is the interest rates on the 10-year bond should be 7.8, but it's not. It's way below where it should be. So basically where the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are at is one, if they do nothing, our economy is gonna rip itself apart. It'll look like Venezuela or Turkey. Not only that, but probably the world economy. Number two, Jerome Powell cutting back in the QE. He could blow it up just by doing the QE because the sensitivity of the bond market tried directly back to the stock market and our housing market. So that's the, the situation where we're at right now. And that is our starship is barreling out of control. And if Jerome or Janet Yellen do not slow this thing down, we're going to have bigger problems than we ever imagined. That's, that's all I got, Stan. Oh, that was Econ 606 in 30 <laughs> minutes. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, the economy is a complicated um, thing. But I'd like to also point out that probably very few of the banks in, in New York or the big banks, they don't really make anything. They just handle money. And you've just kind of gone through a litany of how the interest rates and making money on other people's money is a business. It's a big business. It's a huge business. It has huge implications. 
And energy is also a big business with huge implications tied directly into what the Fed does. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to have this show today, because I think it's really important. And I hope, uh, I hope we get a lot of people looking at it and understanding it so that we don't, we don't overreact to uh, what's going on in our multi-megaton engine and, and we start settling okay. things out. And we well, what, I, what, I, what I try to point out, Stan, is the fuel for the dollar is oil. You have problems with oil that causes problems with the entire world economy. Now, I'm not what I'm trying to tell everybody, especially if we know we, you and I stand, we've talked about this. We have resource problems with oil and those things are not getting any better. When you look at what the new stuff they're finding and the old fields are depleting, that's going to continue to have a problem with the world's economy. We really need to diversify. And this thing we're dealing with right now, I just described how you, I saw how sensitive it was. I mean, a 30-year bond lost almost 10% of its value just last week. How many trillions was that, Stan? That's how sensitive it is. Yeah. We need to do something here, guys. So we've never had a more important time for sane uh, and intelligent government yeah. and policy. And it's not looking good in the D.C. inside the Beltway right now, as far as I'm concerned. So anyway, Dan, thank you so much for really a, a crash course in inflation and connecting it back to the energy world, because that's what this show is about, is energy. Yeah. And it's truly an important commodity worldwide. And now I think people understand why it's even more important. And you can't just be, you know, making radical changes in your oil policy and, and your energy policy without some serious repercussions. Yeah. Well, hopefully everybody will go back and watch that Star Trek episode. And when you watch it, you'll really appreciate what I just described. You'll re okay. This is really what Jerome Powell's, I know he's sweating bullets right now. I can tell you this. I know he's. Yeah. Well, Dan, thanks for being on the show again today. And, um, I'm sure we're going to have another couple economic talks down in the in the future, and uh, I want to have you on at least once a month to, to give us a reality check on energy. So thanks again for being here today, and for everybody out there in Think Tech Land, we'll see you next week Tuesday. And just as a teaser, on the 25th of this month, I have the CEO of Plug Power coming on to talk to us about um, his company that's doing gangbusters around the world in hydrogen. Aloha.